I want to welcome uh, everyone here, especially those of you who are new to the Broad community. I'm Todd Golub, the Chief Scientific Officer of, of the Broad Institute, and I suppose the self-appointed champion of, of an arts program uh, at the Broad. Um, let me just say a little bit about uh, what the Broad Institute is to set the stage for um, why we're uh, here today. The, the Broad is a young organization, a, a research institute that's only six or seven years old. Um, and I think the fact that it's young is, is important. It's filled with young people that have new ideas that aren't encumbered by uh, baggage of old ideas and preconceptions about how biology and medicine in the world is supposed to work. And it also tends to collect not so young people like me, I suppose, that are trying to think about some really old problems that many of us have been struggling with for years or decades or that have vexed humankind for, for centuries and to think about them uh, in a new, way, to, uh, a new way, to look at them through a new lens. And the, and the Broad is really designed to be a place where people could come together and really look at biomedical research in a wholly new way and to tinker with things like how we even organize around doing research that's different from the conventional way that most academic universities operate, where we have teams of scientists from different disciplines, we have students, and we have faculty, and we have professional staff um, working together across computational science to biology to medicine to chemistry um, in such a way that we're really trying to experiment as we go. And so the Broad is really a big experiment in ways to organize to do science, ways to look at old problems, ways to look at the genome that we've known has existed for a long time, but really for the first time, we're able to peer into it and to see how it affects not just a cell, but how it affects society and how it affects humanity. I mean, we're really starting to develop powerful tools that allow us to connect the inner workings of a cell to biology and medicine in a way that I think are, are very powerful. I think doing this successfully requires a certain amount of flexibility in thinking and creativity in thinking uh, to the extent that in many areas of biomedicine we thought we had it all figured out and knew what the basic of the, you know, how the cell and how the body fundamentally worked and I think the new approaches that are now possible because of advances in technologies and, and, and other things now allow us to re-examine some really fundamental questions. We used to think that maybe there were 100,000 genes in the genome. Now we know there are only about 20,000 and somehow humans figure out how to make a human being out of pretty much the same 20,000 genes as a fruit fly has and we don't really understand how that works. Those 20,000 genes only occupy about 1% of the space of the human genome, and we used to call the other 99% junk because clearly it didn't have any important purpose. Now it's very clear that that junk is really, really important and probably explains the difference between a fruit fly and a human, and it's turned much of our thinking totally on its head, and we need to remain flexible and porous to those kinds of really kind of seismic shifts in our, in our view of biology and view of medicine. And so this is really the basis for why uh, some of us, and I should say it's a, it's a bit controversial that we have an arts program at the Broad and have an artist in residence program at the Broad. Um, but those of us that believe in this believe in it because this is a way to continue to challenge our thinking, to force us to open our, wise, our eyes even wider than they are now and that perhaps we think they can be uh, because this is what I think artists do. They provoke us, they, they challenge us to look at old problems in a new way and to say, oh, you think you understand that? Let me ask you some questions and prove to you that there are some approaches to this that you haven't even considered. And this is why we need to have art in our environment, not because it's nice to have 
beautiful paintings on the walls. It is, of course, but it's because it challenges, challenges us to think in a different way. So the concept of this art, artist in residence program is to recruit great artists to the Broad and try to convince them to hang out here and uh, meet with scientists, try to understand what they're thinking, how they're thinking, and if all goes well, have the work of the scientists here influence the thinking of artists in some small way. Uh, and also, if all goes well, to have the work of artists in our community provoke and challenge and change the thinking of, of scientists in some small way, which has the potential to rip, ripple across our scientific community. This is our second experiment with this. Daniel Cohn was our first artist in residence. He initially came with the plan that he would hang out here for a couple of weeks, and that grew to coming for a week, a month, for a year, and then that came to visiting over a period of three or four or five years. Um, so we have this pattern of, of uh, artists dipping a toe in the water and then really connecting in unexpected ways to scientists here. Our current artist in residence, Gupi Ranganathan, who you'll hear from uh, in a couple of minutes, was one such person who came, I think not knowing quite what to expect. We didn't know quite what to expect. And uh, this blossomed into a number of collaborations, I think you could say, that is over the past couple of years has really been uh, fun to watch. So um, with that, I want to introduce first, not Goopy, but uh, one of the scientists with whom Goopy has had a uh, particular connection, uh, and that's Erez Lieberman Aden, who is a uh, scientist at the Broad Institute and Harvard University, and uh, Erez will tell us about his work from a scientific perspective and also what any of this has to do with Goopy and, and her work. Erez. So, so this is uh, Goopy. Uh, Goopy is is a Brody, which is the term of art for someone at the, uh, at the Broad Institute. Um, unlike, um, though, many of her benchmates who tend to use things like pipettes and centrifuges, Goopy has a unique set of tools with which she approaches the questions uh, that we think about here at the Broad Institute, which include things like canvas, uh, paint, uh, a rolling pin, uh, et cetera, a non-traditional a non collection of tools. Uh, and I think that that really highlights, in a way, this incredible and kind of awe-inspiring challenge of what uh, Goopy has been doing over two years, which is essentially to use uh, kind of a completely different uh, vocabulary of, uh, you know, sort of expression and vocabulary of communication and to sort of try to develop that um, in in a totally new context, um, and in a context where everybody else does things in, in a radically different way. So it's very, very impressive. Um, let me tell you a little bit about um, how you know, Goopy's work uh, and, and my work sort of came, came to intersect. So I was telling Goopy about our work, uh, about you know, studying how the human genome folds. The human genome is about two meters long if you stretch it out. It has to fold up inside a five micron wide nucleus. That's several times narrower than the width of a human hair. So clearly it's folding up a great deal. Uh, and so we've done some work that suggested that it might be folding up into a structure called a fractal globule. It's extraordinarily dense, uh, but it's totally unknotted. So you can kind of, you know, grab a piece of this and, and drag it out, and, and the whole thing will sort of locally unravel. This, this particular fractal globule was uh, created by Miriam Huntley um, in my lab, who's in the audience, and, and you can see it on the sixth floor. Um, now, the fractal globules actually, although you know, we kind of obtained sort of the first observational evidence for it a, a couple of years ago, um, it's a dis direct descendant of a certain type of curve called a piano curve that was actually originally discovered by Giuseppe Piano in 1890. And piano curves are interesting because the basic idea in a piano curve is that you're, you're going to try to fold up a one-dimensional object so that you, know, you fold it so carefully and so sort of repeatedly that it ends up being, becoming a two-dimensional object, which is kind of amazing, right? Because things that are one-dimensional usually tend to stay one-dimensional. And so the underlying trick, which is you know, when, when I first uh, met 
Pupin was telling her about the fractal globule, I said, oh, you should see this trick. This is, this is a cool trick that Giuseppe Piano came up with. You see, what you do is you, you take your one-dimensional object and you fold it up kind of like so, and then you sort of take each individual little segment and you sort of repeat that fold. So now we're doing a little zigzag over here, and then a little zigzag over here, and then a little zigzag over here, and all you know, mesh together in a bigger zigzag. Uh, and so now you can see that we've got a sort of more articulated uh, zigzag. Um, and you know, we can articulate this zigzag further, um, and in fact articulate this zigzag further. Uh, you can see from the colors, right, roughly, you know, the, the same underlying zigzag structure is still there, right? It's still going from red to blue in this, in this sort of pattern. Um, and in fact, you can keep articulating this zigzag as far as you go. And in fact, when you do this mathematically, sort of in, you know, what people call the limit, but which is basically a, you know, fancy term of art for uh, do this until you're uh, too exhausted to care. Um, <laughs> you know, it becomes a two-dimensional object. And, and that's the interesting thing about these piano curves. And I, I told her about this, and, um, but you know, this is kind of a kind of crystalline thing, right? So for basically 120 years, people have more or less drawn sort of variants on, on this sort of thing, but they all kind of look uh, the same after a while. They all, they all sort of look like the same sort of thing. Um, but then Goopy sort of started to do these experiments, right, where she would draw space filling curves, and she'd just kind of start screwing around with them in, in interesting ways and just create these, these sorts of crazy visual experiments, you know, dozens and dozens of, of visual experiments uh, messing with, with different properties of how you draw this. Um, and she'd also do these kind of very challenging things, right, which as a scientist, you're not really accustomed to somebody asking you to do this. So, for instance, one day, she, you know, sort of walks on me with some wire, and she says, Ares, I have this wire, I want to make a fractal globule. Um, I was like, well, you know, look, uh, <laughs> maybe you don't get how this works, you know, like if you, if you gave me a, a version of this wire in a computer, I could make the wire become a fractal globule in a computer, but I'm afraid that the wire that you have is terribly real. Um, and for that reason, it doesn't really compute. Um, but actually, this led to these like, great conversations, and kind of Goopy figured out how to make a fractal globule uh, more or less uh, by hand, which is actually amazing, and was actually very, very stimulating uh, for me, just thinking about this sort of problem of how does one actually take a physical object that one presents to you uh, and, and create a fractal globule? And I'm actually, you know, I would actually love to do experiments with, with these structures, except that it's hard to now force them back into your computer, uh, which is part of the challenge. Um, so anyway, so I think that kind of thinking, you know, has been, has been extremely um, interesting. And I think one of the things that's, that's very, very neat um, about working with Goopy is, is the fact that as a scientist, often you're sort of thinking these sorts of things and maybe, you know, maybe you're writing, maybe you're, at the best, you're, you're typing things in Microsoft Word, but then your previous thoughts, the experiments that you had in terms of what you were thinking, right, those, those get edited away when you backspace. And that's, that's in the best case scenario where in your Word, usually, we don't really keep very good track of our thoughts as scientists, but what's very, very interesting um, about the creative uh, process um, for Gooby is that, you know, she's sort of thinking visually and constantly drawing every iteration of sort of what she's thinking, so it creates this record um, of where the ideas come from, and I thought that that was actually very interesting, and I learned a bunch from that, and, and I wanted to tell you about it in the context of this famous sort of uh, statement of Thomas Edison. So Thomas Edison said that success is sort of 1% inspiration plus 99% perspiration, and, and this basic question that you know, both artists and scientists I think think about is this question: Well, where does the where does the inspiration come from? This is, this is my like little diagram of, of what Tom Edison probably published in whatever journal he justified this statement to. Um, so, anyways, but we're, this question of like inspiration is very very mysterious. And what's interesting about what Goopy uh, was doing is you see you know image after image, and it gives you a sense of where inspiration kind of comes from. Um, as an artist, and it actually suggested to me uh, the following sort of modification to Thomas Edison's idea, which is that actually, instead of success, inspiration um, is actually 1% inspiration plus 99% perspiration. It's kind of an amazing thing, right? I mean, just like you, just getting a sense of the sheer number of you know creations that you know Gooby would make before she found sort of a riff that she actually wanted to run with and actually do something with. Um, was actually was, was quite remarkable and actually made me think um, about my kind of creative process as a scientist. Um, 
as well, and just the, the amount of effort it takes to actually you know, come up with something that's, that's worth the perspiration. Um, I mean, of course, for those of us who you know, are, are mathematically minded, that now suggests that, in fact, um, success <laughs> is actually only 0.01% um, inspiration and 99.99% perspiration. My guess is that probably the way this got published was that he just had those error bars and people <laughs> kind of ignored that. Anyway, so, so these curves is amazing, right? So, you know, Gooby did all these really, really interesting um, experiments. And this actually, in, in the context of my own thinking about these curves, which we actually use to model the genome, and together, you know, between kind of Gooby's uh, work and also some other work um, of uh, Bill Gosper, who's also kind of working this boundary of, of art and science, led us to start experimenting with different ways of creating uh, the piano curve. And this is one of them. Um, I, I should... I mean, so you can see it looks radically different. It comes from essentially a different way of sampling this two-dimensional limiting function. But the, the critical thing to bear in mind is this looks radically different. It actually has a number of mathematically sort of different and very interesting um, properties. But, you know, if you sort of do this limiting process of iterating it over and over and over again, it actually turns out to end up being identical to what you get with, with the original uh, piano curve. But this type of curve, I mean, this is pretty much, you know, the first one that had ever been drawn. People never drew these curves this way um, before. And so, I mean, I think that, you know, our zigzag technology has actually improved markedly as a result of Goopy's experimentation. Um, so with that, I just wanted to highlight one of Goopy's pieces, which, which I've enjoyed um, immensely, one of, one of my favorite pieces, and, and turn it over to Goopy to tell us about uh, her experience here at the Broad. Presentation. Close this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, and hello, everyone. It's been a great pleasure for me over the last two years to be the artist in residence here, be a Brody, and develop artworks and then share those artworks with you. When I first came into Broad, I came in with artworks that looked like this very painterly, very detailed, and sort of they took a long time making, and so it was very interesting to me that I was making these artworks when I came in as a painter. I looked at science as an art. I'd always made art that was like lying in the intersection between science and spirituality, but you can see a lot of light, color, movement, all these are major points of interest in my paintings. They're also very cellular. I, in fact, made wood blocks, which I would paint, and then I would burn into them, and then create more structures and layers and build upon them until they started resembling things that we see under the microscope. Some of my wood blocks, or most of them, in fact, turned out to be very painterly. Even my etchings, they have a lot of perspective of space. I'm talking about things that an artist is always thinking about when they're making painterly paintings. In fact, I started taking some of those wood blocks and started painting them, burning into them, and then rolling them out, like making handprints, painting the canvas, so to say, and then printing them out and making these variations in wood when I came in for my interviews and met Todd Golub and Bang Wong. Some of them had collaged elements from my wood blocks, and they had narratives as well, and sort of taking a scientific process and trying to understand what the scientific process means and broadening the meaning in terms of the bigger meaning of life. That was what I was addressing when I came into Broad. And then I came into Broad for my first meeting and Todd and Bang Erez meet four scientists, Erez, Sarah, Kat, and Dawn, who had volunteered, wonderful scientists and researchers and people, who came along and said that they would be willing to collaborate with me on my project. And they told me that there were a whole bunch of books that they wanted me to look and read up materials so that I could understand the language that they were comfortable with and that they were talking, starting with the Cartoon Guide to Gen Genetics. I went on to online courses and a lot of reference books that passed on to me. And then when I came into the broad, they started talking to me about papers and cooking ramen noodles. That was how Erez introduced his project to me. He talked about the fractal globule and the Hilbert curl but he explained to me how it could be compressed and folded just by cooking ramen. And boy, did we have ramen for the next two weeks. <laughs> it was a pleasure as well. 
he explained to me a lot of things about his paper, but one of the things that intrigued me about the paper was that he was talking about the genome as if it were a line. And to me, when he, somebody talks of line, space, area, volume, depth, mass, it means that they're speaking in terms that I'm interested in as an artist. It's something each artist in a studio explores. So I went back home, and I got out the electrical wire out of my basement, and I said, I've got to try and make this somehow. See whether this diagram works for me in a language. There's something interesting and mysterious about it. So that's my first effort at the piano curl. I brought it back to Erez, and he said, it's almost there. It's OK, but it's not great. But it's almost there. And the Hilbert curl was a disaster. Because the diagrams that he showed me was so complicated, and it was so pulled and compressed that it was difficult for me to figure out. Because the Hilbert curve has seven segments, and there's an eight connecting segments which changes direction, so to say. And so it was very confusing for me to see a complicated diagram and then make it on a smaller level with something that was concrete. So I brought it back to him and handed it to him, and I think he had never expected anything like that, a person to come up to him and say, prove your hypothesis to me in concrete terms, so to say. Not that I was suspecting him, but it was more of venture and adventure into exploring what it means to me as an artist. Because when you learn bicycling, all you want to do is to understand what is bicycling. And when you want to capture it in painting, you want to either observe it closely or to bicycle yourself. So in fact, for me, I was making the fractal globule for myself. And at the same time, I started all my visual exploration, all my initial drawings, so to say. I tried different forms of exploring the genome. Could it be flat? Could it be perspectival? Should I increase or change the width of the lines as they fold and come closer to me? What should I do? How do I distinguish? Because this is one of the questions that Erez has asked me, was that when a line comes and folds, how do you know one line is in front of another? Because it's such a complicated fold. How do you visually represent it? As a painter, I know that my painting skills and my perspectival skills, when I pull the line and I change the color, everything's going to work. But broad is all about information. It's not necessarily about aesthetics. But what can you convey? But can you convey it also in a beautiful manner? How are we going to solve that problem as well? So it's trying different ways of handling the same thing, painterly ways and other ways. And then I started doing the drawings based on what Erez had described to me on the paper. We kept meeting almost on a weekly basis. And he would come up to me, and we would discuss for some time. And we would sometimes even sketch and paint while he was explaining things to me so that I would get the hang of things. And I decided that I would start by making prints of drawings that I got out of his proportion so that I could understand the Hilbert curve. And I also started taking paintings from my undergraduate days, which had some solar context to them, and started burning into them the structure of the genome as he explained it to me. And it resulted in these sorts of prints and installations that I made, a series of prints and drawings. Some of them, one of the main discussions that we did have was whether it should be curvilinear or rectilinear, because the model or the actual thought process is something very curvilinear. But when you start explaining or trying to describe to someone or draw information from it, it becomes much more complicated. It looks very much like ramen if you started making it. So I decided to go with the rectilinear model and make a series of prints in the rectilinear way to think of folding and to also make another, because I'm an artist and I have to break the rules. So I started making curvilinear and rectilinear. At the same time, I was holding talks and discussions with all the other scientists. I would come in whenever they were available and chat with them over the projects. They would pass their papers to me, explain, sit, explain some of the language that I still did not get so that I could understand it in layman terms as an artist. And this was one of the large mixed media artworks that I made with cats on neural network on bi bipolar disorder. And she was talking to me about it, and I kept doing this. It was a big ink drawing. It's an ink a sketch, so it takes a long time. But what I noticed was Erez's lines kept creeping into them. And so it was very interesting for me that this was happening. And so I went back to the wire. But then at the same time, I'm looking through everybody. Sarah is talking about complex one disease, Kat about neural networks and bipolar disorder, Don Thompson about predicting the past and how we all came to be, and it is about the genome and how it falls. And I'm thinking of Paul Gauguin's painting, because in the left top corner, he writes in French, this is the question that he asks, where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? It resounded in me as an artist because it's a personal exploration of birth, life, disease, decay, and death, and the great beyond. But also, I realized that he had done it because he had been thinking about a question that a cleric had asked him when he was in high school about humanity. And that touched upon the card in the very area, sort of the intersection that I live in, 
which is art and spirituality on one hand. And I was thinking about what all the Brodies here do, which is the same questions that you're addressing, the same mystery in your own ways of where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going? And so I drew a lot of inspiration from these, this question. So I went back to the drawing board, so to say, in this case, not a drawing board, but a wooden block with a whole bunch of electrical wire. And I tried different types of wire, and I was thinking, and that was when I told Erez, as he proclaims, that I came up with wire and asked him, could we make a big fractal globule out of it? And let me search for wire that might work with it. And I started looking for armature coil, aluminum coil, because the more you bend the electrical wire, it would just break, and it wouldn't do the same function that I thought it could fold and open and fold and open. Well, Erez was interested in the puzzle of the structure, I was interested in always in opening the structure to see what it meant to me. But I wasn't cognizant of what I was doing, and I was very frustrated. So I did what every self-respecting artist like me does. I take a break. I go to India for a vacation for a month. And I take the wire along with me. I was still playing with the wire. I don't know how it got through, but it, it did. <laughs> and I was playing with it over there. And I heard a lot of jokes about playing with electrical wire for an artist's residency. And nothing came to fruition for quite some time until it was the end of the trip. I went to a temple, a very ancient temple. It's been since 680. And it had this inner courtyard full of thousands, an uh, inner courtyard filled with these massive pillars and sculptures that you can see behind it. And I was realized as I was looking at them, because each of these pillars and each of these sculptures have been made by artists from different periods of time. And they have come from different regions, maybe. But they have made the same thing. I recognize it as a pillar. I recognize it as the same sculpture. The dimensions are different. The proportions are different. Some of them are more ornate. Some of them are more abstract. So it was very interesting to me about this. And that was when I think I realized what it was that was interesting to me about the wire and what it was doing when I was opening it up. At the same time, the, what I was also thinking of was the Bharatanatyam classical dance where you have mudras and karanas, but body physical movements and hand gestures, which are sort of turning around, but they hold the posture for a little longer so that you sort of get cogn the audience is cognizant of the structure or form that they're making. It is very important. I thought, aha, that's what I need to do. Because whenever I'm opening it up, it's opening up in very interesting ways. And it, there's so many infinite combinations that I can have. And so I said, I have to go back to the blackboard. I have to get back to my studio. So the moment I reached my studio, I pulled out my wires. I started manipulating them. And I started doing drawings of them in post-it sketchy notes. Simply started doodling. One of the other questions that Todd Gollub had asked me about when I come to the interview was, how are we going to address and bring the person in the lab closer to the person on the street and vice versa, and how to get that relationship going? And I was thinking of one of the things that's common to all of us is our culture. So I thought of The Simpsons, of course. So I said, I'm going to think of a form where you have a thin line, where you can still make form and structure and inform it, but have it really simple like doodles. And make it also into shapes and forms that are recognizable. So some might look like T-Rex, some might look like human beings, some might look like dogs. And you can play a guessing game with it forever and ever. But what was most interesting for me was that there are infinite possible ways in which the genome can unfold or the wire can unfold. And I am attempting maybe 108 of them that are distinctive. And even though I tried 108, as usual, I overshot the mark, and I landed up with around 120 that looked different. So the moment I had this, I was thinking, 120 drawings, different postures, what does it mean to me in the real world? And I'm thinking of Simpsons, animation, video. So we've got to put this all together. And that's where the idea of the video came in. And Bang Wong introduced me to Lars Eric Seren. And it was a great collaboration working with him these last few months. And thinking of the video, it started off as animation stills. But then we also started discussing. By the time I came into the pre-production meeting, Erez had so eloquently talked about the two-meter genome being so small it could fit into the size of the head of a pin. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic, because then my video should start with a dot and finish with a dot so it can loop up back again. Because that's the continuing thought of life. So it's not just the genome unfolding now. For me, it's life unfolding. And how can I think about that in a broader terms for, me, for myself? As I'm doing all this, 
I'm also realizing another thing. That's exactly what you people and I am doing over here at Broad. Broad. What I'm doing is trying to understand and make clearer things that are not so apparent to us. So I was thinking, if I am interested in all the linear lines in these 60 drawings, the last three rows based on Erez's explanation of the segment of the genomic line which cannot tangle, well, it does all its magic, so to say, then maybe there are different types of lines as well that I can concentrate on because the genomic landscape is so complex. I'm thinking back on the projects that I have done. So I'm thinking of other types of linear combinations, the top two rows based on organic structures and chemical structures, branch segments and closed loops. And the third row refers to all the sort of data and drawings and connectivity maps and every different abstraction of organic shapes that I found in different papers when I was discussing formally or informally. So of course, what do I do when I land up with so many drawings and so many ideas? I come back into Broad and have meetings with people. So I came in and had a meeting with Todd and Bang. And during the meeting, Todd, had, Todd started talking about how amazing it was that four simple structures, C, G, A, and T, could combine in so many ways to make up everything that informs us as we are, and all the world around us or the universe around us. So it was interesting to me because I had seen the genome sequence pattern in almost every project here at Broad. It's sort of the backdrop. It's something you refer to always. And I was thinking, duh, it's a genomics institute. What are you thinking? You have to come back to that. But the best part of it is that you see them in four colors, four basic colors, saturated, super saturated colors, red, yellow, blue, green. You can't miss it in the lobby if you go in and see the machine. So I was thinking, how wonderful it would be, or how, what, what, what a challenge it would be, or interesting it would be as a colorist for me, a painterly painter, to just restrict myself to those four basic colors, other than, of course, white or black. And as a colorist, I don't think of them as colors. So there you go. And so I said, let me have the color as the backdrop and have the lines make in the foreground be the real connections that I'm talking about and start looking at them for ways in which we inform each other. Because one of the things that happens at Broad is that all the information and data that seeps in is pooled together. And something that happens in one project might affect what is happening in another project and that information is shared back and forth. And so that was interesting to me. And so I said, this is something, it's getting me somewhere, and it's allowing me to be painterly because I have now introduced color into it. And I was also revisiting my prints from the earlier year, and I started tearing them up, collaging them. I was thinking of ways in which I could address the anthropomorphic version of the lines so that I could represent them in a way that made sense to me visually, and at the same time, in terms of structure and information. How are the pathways different? Maybe there's a way I can address that complexity as well. That didn't stop there, because I realized that the more information that is shared by different groups of scientists and researchers, there are different types of lines that are sort of layered one on top of the other. And so it started playing around with them more and more. And I started building larger paintings based on this. I'm just showing you some of the rest points, so to say, when I'm painting, so that you know how I'm trying to base the layers based on the different structures that I'm seeing in these, in these earlier 60 drawings and 40 paintings. So I start building them slowly, one by one, so that one, maybe the organic, the chemical structure, the biological structure, and the genomic structure start interplaying along with each other. It was interesting for me to see them come together as a whole, to also appreciate the sort of research that goes in where you're searching for something so small in almost an infinite space. So I thought it was interesting. And also the other part of experimentation, where you put things back together again. I may have padded down to the basics, saying that these are the lines, or these are the shapes that the genome can take. But what happens, what interesting thing happens when you put it back together to see whether it comes together as a whole again? That's a very interesting point for me in experimentation. And so you land up with a painting that looks like this. Most of the paintings that you see in the lobby outside, of course, refer to the last parts of my residency where I'm putting all these structures together. They address that. And while I'm doing all these paintings, I'm also making my coils. Now that Erez has told me that maybe it's not possible, I have to try it, right? <laughs> so I get around 20 coils, and I start trying them. I fold them, and I unfold them, and I play around with them to see what happens. And it's so interesting for me that every time I change it, it sort of changes drastically 
the way it turns and then shapes itself again, but when I fold it, like compressing it together, it comes back together again. And that sort of playful attitude and the sort of experimentation that I had continued even while putting up the sculpture. I, I think, yeah, put up around 18 coils over there and I was playing around with it and seeing what happened when I unfolded it because the theme was no longer folding but unfolding for me. And so I'm thinking about it and saying, what happens when it's a single line? What happens when it's grouped in clusters? Can a genome actually open itself completely in a cell? Or does it just open up in parts? But no matter what it does, it's interesting to me the sort of interactions that it has with each other as, as it develops on its own. It's almost as if I'm watching a line moving in space with a mind of its own. And so then I revisit my prints back again because that's what you normally do when I'm doing my final paintings. Because now I've started creating these paintings which are very hard edged, they're not as painterly. And it was interesting for me to revisit these prints back again and started tearing up them again, which is what I normally do as a process, and collage them. And make them into something that came back into Eris's territory. Sort of seeing the things that are within the way he informed me, which came in terms of collage samples, and what I came to inform him in terms of the structures and the information flow outside the samples, bringing it back together again. And the other thing, interesting thing for me was it became a little more organic, my artworks, even though I had, in the, towards the end, gotten more hard edge in terms of what I think of as an artist. And so what does it boil down to for me? That this artist in residency has been to a large extent about the Hilbert curve. But for me as an artist, what is most interesting is that I'm visually experimenting to see what is unseen or what is invisible. That for me is the most interesting part. Thank you.